Our scripture reading today is found in Romans 12, verse 2. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be trans transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Happy Sabbath, church. It's a beautiful Sabbath. <laughs> well, it just so happened that it worked out that I was able to be here today. Usually I'm up at Marathorpe, the second Sabbath, and um, they had a guest speaker that came in, so I didn't have to go. And uh, then I got the text from Pastor Jason that... We need a speaker for the Sabbath, as Peter is sore. Oh, man, that's quite something. But good to be here. Today our topic is, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about renovations today. Renovations. Have you ever done renovations? No? No. How did it go? <laughs> I see some of this going on. Have you ever done renovations with someone else? How did that go? Good. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> You'll hear a story about one that didn't go so well today. <laughs> Embarking on a renovation project can be a transformative experience. Uh huh. Not just for the physical space being renovated, but also for the individuals involved. It says the process of renewal and improvement is deeply rooted in biblical te teachings. It says offering valuable lessons on workmanship, collaboration, and guidance. We're going to look at some uh, as we look at renovations today. <laughs> today. A renovation is a change in your house or whatever you're working on, right? Um, from one state to another, usually from a worse state to a better state, right? But not always. <laughs> I remember a number of years ago, actually it was quite a few years ago, probably shortly after we moved up here, so it was maybe the early 2000s or so, I'm not sure, I happened to go to a garage sale and as I arrived there, there was a, a pile of oak casing and baseboard, newel posts, handrails, spindles, big pile of oak that was there. <laughs> and a number of us guys stood around this pile and we we're looking, just kind of shaking our heads, like, what's going on? And uh, the fellow that was there from the house uh, looked at it, you know, look, it was, it was there, and he said, well, I want you to know, guys, that was not my, my decision. <laughs> my wife was tired of the wood. It was tired of the oak, and she wanted MDF, painted grade, right? And so he looked a little embarrassed about the whole thing. <laughs> and the rest of us were standing around, shaking our heads, you know, like, we feel it, man, we feel it. <laughs> You know, and, uh, and I was just kind of thinking, you know, this is a good example, maybe, of uh, renovations are not always going necessarily from a worse state to a better state. It could just be a change of state, right? Someone got tired of the oak. And uh, I don't know, it, it's a hard one. We were like, uh, I love oak. I love wood, real wood. And working with MDF is... Whatever, it works, but not the same. I don't know, because I guess I started finished carpentry 
in the early 90s, and that was, everything was oak. That's what we put in. There was hardwoods of some sort. And everything went in. It was just beautiful. I love it. And I just think MDF is just <laughs> so inferior. But anyway, that, that was my own, my own thoughts anyway in regard to that. But turn your Bibles to Philippians 1.6. We're going to look a little bit here. Renovations, lessons we can learn. Philippians 1 verse 6. And you can join in on the study. Maybe things that you've learned, spiritual lessons you've learned uh, doing renovations. <laughs> Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't it, there's a wonderful principle here. Begun a good work. Isn't it good to start good, right? If you don't start good, what's going to happen down the road? <laughs> You'll be fixing and fixing and fixing, right? We know that doing renovations. Beginning with a good work and then performing that good work all the way to the end. That is a spiritual lesson and wonderful that God does that with us, right? He begins a good work, he starts good, and then he continues that good work all the way to the end. Now, within renovations, now this is new construction or renovations for that matter, the work of each trade affects all the trades down the line. Is that not true? <laughs> My dad always said, every framer should actually st first start as a finished carpenter. For one, they'll learn how to measure. It won't be just like, okay, somewhere about there, X, cut, right? No, <laughs> no, it's important to be able to, uh, but what you do learn as a finished carpenter, especially work in certain situations, you'll know those that framed well and those that did not frame well very, very quickly. So that's why it's always good if you can, start as a finished carpenter, then you'll become an awesome Framer. Now I know uh, that we're doing new carpentry, uh, finished carpentry, the framers that we, we followed after were amazing. We loved them. <laughs> they were great. The drywallers, credible. And it's wonderful doing your work in new, new construction because if you follow after guys that are just awesome, it makes your work so much easier, right? <laughs> now a good example I think we can learn uh, are studs. Studs have a crown, do they not? Most do, anyway. If they don't, that's good. Now, if you have studs there with crowns and you have some up and then some down, what happens to your wall? <laughs> you start going like this, right? Start going like this. So yeah, it's always, that's what the, you learn laying out walls is to check the studs. And if it has a real big bend in it, what do you do with it? <laughs> becomes blocking for something, right? How important it is, because that becomes a nightmare down the road for somebody else, right? Finished carpenter. How about tilers? You're tiled on a wall that was like this? Especially big tiles, oh, they go off into space, right? I remember once I was, I was asked to put a floor in, they wanted hardwood, and I said, that's fine. So I never checked the, with the floor out, and it was an older home. Oh, my. So I first started to lay out the floor, right? And all of a sudden, the hardwood took off into space, like literally. And I'm talking about space, like lots. And that's on uh, whatever short boards. And I thought, what is this? So I put a straight you know, a level on the floor, and literally the house went like this, and then all downhill. I couldn't believe it, because like something's happened. I mean, yeah, anyway. So I, I had to call them up and tell them. They weren't there at the time. I said, <laughs> You're not getting hardwood floors. This hardwood doesn't bend like that, especially thick hardwood, right? He uh, said, so that's not going to happen. So we had to go plan B. So they didn't, didn't like it too much, but they had no choice <laughs> except for redoing the floor. But yeah, it affects everything else uh, down the way. I remember my dad telling me the story of, this is, uh, this is new construction, though. Uh, the north part of Red Deer, there was a new subdivision going in. And um, he was doing the finished carpentry in this particular house. 
And uh, this whole subdivision was built on a swamp. They just basically backfilled the thing and they had built this whole subdivision on it. That's fine, I guess, but what was happening was, was uh, when he got to the finished carpentry stage, my dad said whenever the cement trucks would roll down the road, the whole house would shake. Not just, it would shake so bad there was actually cracks in the new drywall. You know, it had already been painted, he was doing finished carpentry, and there's huge cracks that are forming, you know, in the house. And uh, I guess it shows you the importance of good foundation, right? I guess they hadn't run their pylons down far enough and the whole house was just floating. So can you imagine a finished home and they had to repile that whole thing and they had to go down a thing like 20 feet or I forget, it was a long way down before they actually hit good solid ground. <laughs> so that was the expensive oops. Uh, I'm sure it cost them a lot, but we can see that affects not just trades down the thing, it affects the whole home right? Simply because of mistake. Cutting corners. Can we learn a lesson not to cut corners, right? Wow. That's one thing you can learn. Uh, you learn with renovations for sure. Another story uh, is one, and then I think it's fraught with a lot of lessons. I was called by an individual and said, you know, I had a contractor here that made a mess of the house and you just need to come and see it. And I hope you can fix it. And so when we got there, um, there was broken glass all around the, the, the house. Well, not all around the house, part of the around the house. I think the guy learned. Apparently what he did is when he was taking the outside or the upper windows out, he just literally just pushed them, like dumped them. And there was glass all over the ground. It wasn't, it was under a tarp. If at least he put a tarp down, it would have been better than nothing. But it was in the long grass besides, and poor Christine had to collect a lot of glass <laughs> that time. I couldn't believe it. Um, just shows the kind of work the individual had. But then what had happened was, was I guess he had done the renos inside. Oh, that was another thing. There was all these flies in the house, couldn't figure out where, and I was, I, I, was, I, I was looking around and could see them. They were actually crawling out from the casing around the windows. And so I popped off the casing, and here I could see daylight out through them. It wasn't even insulated, right? So, as, so I thought, if this one is that way, so I had popped off a whole bunch, and there were a whole bunch of windows in the upper one where the guy had never insulated around the windows. And it was so poorly done on the outside that, yeah, you could see daylight through them, so all the flies were collecting. And so I had to take my vacuum and suck up probably about 100 flies out of one window. They were just, that's where they had congregated. And uh, so I was like, this is unbelievable, the workmanship that went into this. And, uh, and then this, this next thing, and then... <laughs> What the guy did, apparently, he, had, he was working with his son, and they had a fallout somehow. There was a disagreement that took place. And after this disagreement, I guess the guy came back drunk into the house, grabbed his sprayer, because the house was already painted. But he grabbed his sprayer, and he went through the whole house and just sprayed on the walls like huge runs. And then he sprayed the floor, the ceiling, and then the windows and stuff. He just went berserk. And so we had to come along and clean this whole mess up. And I remember I went through a sander pad, not the sanding disc, but the actual pad was burnt right through. <laughs> Sanding through, they wouldn't even hold pads after that. Now I'm trying to sand all these drips off the walls. Um, it was just unbelievable. And I was thinking, there's lessons that can be learned from this, and one is the aspect of, you know, if you, start, if you have that kind of attitude to start that way, it's gonna end bad, right? And, and the, the disagreement that took place between the father and the son was over something. And I think there's some lessons, and we're going to look at that in a little bit uh, in regard to it. But that was a mess of a place. It was totally trashed. <laughs> it, it was incredible. But turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. I, I, I think there's a good, good um, premise here that we can learn from renovations and building anything, it doesn't matter what it is. Genesis 1, starting with verse 1, we know very well, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, 
And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was what? There was light, right? And then he, and God saw the light, that it was what? Right at the beginning, God looks at his work, and he says, ah, that's good, right? Should not that be when we build or renovate? We're at each stage, starting with the beginning, that we be able to stop and look at it and say, ah, it's good, right? There's a wonderful principle there that I see that within the creation week. And then we see that as we go on, as God creates the next. He looks and he says, hey, it's good, right? And then he does it again. And he looks and he says, ah, it's good. So at each stage, it's very important to be able to look and be able to say, hey, it's good. It's good. Now notice at the very beginning when God created, what did he create first? Is light important? Is it important for renovations? Anything looks good in the dark, right? <laughs> it's true. Anything looks good in the dark. If you're building something, you're creating something, it's important to have some light if you want it to look good. Because it's most likely we visually watched and looked at in the light, right? Can we learn some lessons in regard to light and taping and dry and mudding. Oh man, nothing worse than having pot lights going in right along the, right along the wall, right? Shows everything. It's got to be good. It's got to be perfect. If you sand with a light, you're going to see it. So we see a wonderful thing. In the spiritual lesson, do we not need light? That's the whole wonderful thing. And what does light reveal? Darkness, yeah, <laughs> defects, right? It reveals defects in us, and we need that light, and we see that in the creation week. God is doing a work not just in the creation week, not just whatever, but he's doing it in us, right? And light is such an important thing. Now, what in the spiritual sense would light be? Truth, yeah. God's word. The law, yeah. Yeah. These are all things which are the light which God shines upon us to be able to reveal things in us, right, which we so much need. And uh, it is so important. But yeah, if you build with a light, good lighting, it makes a massive difference, and especially with muddy and sanding, that's for sure. Now, another thought that I had when I was thinking of this whole aspect of anything we can learn from renovations is the aspect that we need others. Now, I, I renovate oftentimes by myself, but I really like working with somebody else. And the reason why two heads sometimes is better than one, right? Just to be able to have somebody to bounce ideas off of and concepts and whatever, or if you run into a troublesome situation, what do we do? You know, we, you know, if you have two people thinking, it's actually awesome. And God is a God of diversity, is he not? He's a God of diversity. Not everybody has exactly thinks the same way, nor has the same skill set. And it's wonderful when you have multiple individuals uh, that you can actually bounce ideas off and get ideas doing renovations. And I like it. Uh, I actually like it. But can it cause some problems? Sometimes it can. <laughs> and... Uh, and I think that's, that's where we have to be able to work through that. Uh, in Psalms 104, 24, it says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. God has great diversity in, in what he's created, is he not? Like in, in, in his creation, we see great diversity, whether you look at the flower, whether you look at the animals. I, I, I'm always amazed looking at um, animals in the sea, right? Underwater photography or videography, the variety of things down there, like they said, it's a totally different another world, and we've only discovered a small portion of it, whether it's actually in the ocean. But we see great diversity. God is a God of diversity. That's why when he talks about the church being his body and each member is very important, everything interacts and is interconnected, is it not, in what God creates. I like that. And, in, and, and it says, in wisdom hast thou made them all. So you would think of all the different things that we, we see in all the different variety, in wisdom he made each one of those things, right? 
for a purpose. And you know, we think, oh, well, there's no purpose in this or that, or what's the purpose of this? It, God says everything that he's created is there for a reason. It's a purpose, right? I love that. In wisdom thou hast made them all, says the earth is full of thy riches. God is a God of diversity. And Colossians 1, 15 and 16 says, Who is the image of the invisible God? Says the firstborn of every creature. Says, For by him were all things created. Says that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and what? For him, right? All things, this great diversity of animals and things in this world were all created by him, but also for him. That's pretty neat when you think of that. God is a God of diversity. I think some that teaches us this aspect of a God of diversity and some that we can learn from this are the two hemispheres of the brain, right? I like this, the interaction between the two hemispheres of the brain is a testament says to the complexity and adaptability of the human mind. Studies have shown that each hemisphere is speci has specialized functions. It says, yet they do not operate in isolation. Can we learn a lesson? Do you see that? They do not work in, 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 in isolation. They work together. Instead, they communicate. Is communication important? <laughs> Can we learn a lesson? They communicate, says, through a structure called the corpus callosum, which is the bridge between the two hemispheres, right? Says, allowing for integrated cognitive processes. Says, this interhemispheric um, co collaboration is essential for tasks that require a combination of logical analysis and creative thought demonstrating that cognitive functions are more interconnected than previously believed. Both are needed to fire. Both are needed to work in harmony, right? That is the important part. It says the interdependence of the, the cerebral hemispheres says is um, evident in tasks that require the combination of different cognitive functions. For example, Language, predominantly a left hemisphere activity, often needs the right hemisphere's nuanced understanding of context and tone to comprehend jokes or sarcasm. Do you see that? Working together properly. Similarly, it says, while the right hemisphere may recognize a familiar face, it says it is the left hemisphere that helps attach a name to that face. Are you good at that? No, I, I think we lose it on the left, right? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know you. I have, cannot remember your name, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, something's not firing really well there. Anyway, at least with me. But I, I'm always amazed at people that can remember names. I remember going into uh, Get Coal once a year. And the lady, the next year, would just, oh, write down my name. It's like, how is that possible? You haven't seen me for a whole year, and yet you knew my name. And it would be the, the next person come in, same way. And it's like, that's not fair, right? It's just not fair. Like, I don't know. She took it all from the rest of us. I don't know. It was incredible. So the corpus callosum, the structure, and I love this. This fascinating, we can learn a lesson here, the two hemispheres, Different operations, but working together, right? There's a unity, a unifying factor of it. So the corpus callosum, the structure that connects the two hemispheres, could represent the spiritual need for unity and connection, right? As highlighted in Ephesians 4.3, it says, urging believers, it says, to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Just as the two halves of the brain communicate and work together um, to create a cohesive experience, so too are individuals called to work in unity within the body of Christ. Do you see the spiritual lesson that we can learn there? Now, you know, another fascinating thing about the corpus callosum, it actually has um, inhibitory functions built into it that prevent one hemisphere from overpowering the other. Isn't that amazing? God has created us amazingly, has he not? But don't you see within even the brain the aspect of diversity? 
And we're a diverse, um, uh, you know, individuals here within this church. But each one of you are needed. If one is even removed, we suffer, right? One is injured, we suffer. There's this aspect I see here of unity, which I find fascinating. But yes, do, do we need sometimes an inhibitory thing to bring unity between the two hemispheres, even within the church, within us, right? We do. What do you think that might be? What is this corpus callosum in the spiritual sense, would you say? Any ideas? Sorry? Pride? No, because it's a unifying factor. What unifies God's people? Yeah. It brings together and it also inhibits, you know, so, for, so one does not dominate the other side, right? Holy Spirit, right? Does not the Holy Spirit do this in each one of us? Is not the Holy Spirit the unifying factor in the church? Sure he is. And I think this is awesome. Uh, as, as we look at the brain and as we look at the diversity and how that all comes together and lessons we can learn. But this diversity is needed also within renovations. <laughs> That's why I said, praise the Lord for others that, that we, we can call upon and, and to be able to get information. Um, many, many people that are doing the trades, believe it or not, watch YouTube videos, right? I've talked with a lot of them. And yet, guys, you would think you'd, that knew everything. They're like, no, you don't know everything. You, you continually learn. And he says, there's always a better way of doing whatever you did, right? So literally, they do. They watch YouTube videos. And I've talked with many of them, many in the, within the trades that still watch YouTube videos because they want to learn, which is good. That's, we all need to be that whole aspect of I want to learn. If you think you know everything, not good, right? <laughs> So, Jeremiah 22, 13 says, and this is one every contractor likes, I guess. It says, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, it says that using his neighbor's services without wages, and giving him not for his work. Right? Bible principle. If somebody's working for you, pay them. Right? Thankfully, I haven't had problems in that area. People are actually really good, so praise the Lord for that. Psalms 127, verse 1 says, and I'd like to end with this thought. Does anyone, actually, before I end with this thought, does anyone have any lessons that they've learned with renovations that they'd like to share? Aha, thank you. We need a mic, though. Could somebody grab a mic? There's lots, but these are just some of the ones I thought of. Uh, we did we did one renovation, a major renovation, a basement res renovation in Calgary yeah. um, in our last house. Um, I'd never done a major renovation. Um, this was my first house that I had bought. Um, I'm not a skilled tradesperson. I'm not a finishing carpenter. Um, and I would say, you know, and, and, and I'll let you expound on the biblical context, but... Um, <laughs> I had my uncle, who is a finishing carpenter, been in the trade for 40, 50 years, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and if it wasn't for a guiding hand yeah. to help me uh, and, and the wisdom of, of a person, a teacher, mm -hmm. um, uh, the wisdom of a master, can I put it that way? Yep. The wisdom of a master, I would have been sunk. <laughs> so I'll let you. <laughs> so is knowledge important? Yeah, it the is. Was important. Uh, sorry? The master was important. Absolutely. But the, but the knowledge came from the master. That's, my, I guess, the, the, the point, right? Do we need that spiritually? Sure we do. You know, and that is where we need to be teachable. We need to learn. We need to realize our great dependence. <laughs> uh, in that, it's very, very true. That's one regret, I guess, or whatever. I don't know if it's a regret, but I wish I could have spent more time with my dad. My dad was an incredible carpenter, and I learned what I did working with him, but I wish it was just longer. 
A lot of it I had to learn on my own, and that was back before YouTube. <laughs> and so it was not easy. I would try to talk with people, get ideas and stuff, but a lot of it you learn, sadly, if you don't have somebody to mentor under. You gotta learn it the hard way, right? And it's not, it's not easy, that's for sure. But if he, yeah, I wish she hadn't passed away so early. And, and I would have spent more time with him, because yeah, you're right, to work under someone who knows right and is a master of the trade uh, it is amazing but spiritually speaking we all have that same master right that we can learn from and he's teaching us day by day whether we know it or not actually right in life's experiences that come to us and i've seen that even whether in renos god speaks to me <laughs> a lot you know and yeah we learn randy had a comment Well, before moving here, I had virtually done no renos. Um, and as you know, that house has been fully renovated and probably time to start again. Um, <laughs> I always got the last word in. Yes, dear. <laughs> um, nothing takes five minutes. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but uh, you learn patience. Yeah. And you can do it. Yeah. You can do it with, yeah. and you know, I'm thankful for your help, Greg. It's, uh, <laughs> you've often been the one we've called on to, you've, you've done a lot of the work there, but sometimes we've worked together too. And it's, uh, you know, even that little project with Ev's house last right. winter and that crooked, <laughs> crooked walls and floors and stuff. But there's a way. You have to be patient, and you you learn. Okay, yeah. and and there's a whole lot of learning go, goes on yeah. when you do it. Intuitively, you learn things that you never thought you could. Absolutely. Right. And you know what? Hey. Oh. And you're never done. And you're never done. <laughs> and you're right. never done. No. That part's true. But you know, I want to. You 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 actually brought up a good point <laughs> when you said uh, yes, dear. <laughs> we need the yes, dears. And the reason why, this is, this is why I said, you know, the way, uh, hey, otherwise, just think of it. Many of us guys are good, you know, we, we can actually create things, and it looks very, very good, right? Uh, we can build a house, and you know what? Finished carpentry is perfect. The corners are perfectly mitered, you know, even if you do crown molding, that's a whole other thing. They're perfect, right? You can do all that, and all you're left with at the end of it is a very well manicured tomb, right? Now, a lady's touch comes in and she decorates it, right? It now becomes a home. Are both needed? Yes, and that's the thing that is very important. We need each other, you know, not just us or just my thinking, right? And that's where God is a God of diversity. He gives us different talents and we bring those talents together and it makes a home, right? Yes, go ahead. Okay, and then Mike. I can't say I've done a lot of renovations. I've watched and tried to help and try to give ideas, but um, but the thing I was thinking of is the tools that you have, the right materials. That's yeah. really important. You have cheap material. You get a cheap product. And if you don't have the right tools, really it makes it a much more difficult. To yeah, or it's really hard to work with it, right? Yeah. I mean, the yeah. materials. Though on that note, I mean, I totally agree with you about the tools, and I'm one with tools. Um, but I'll tell you what, my dad told this story. Oh, Mike is next. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, back there. I'll tell you the story here. My, my dad actually worked doing finished carpentry years ago down in California. That's when they lived down there for a short period of time. And they were working on Loma Linda Hospital, the big hospital in Loma Linda. And they were up on whatever floor it was, and he was working for a guy um, that was a finished carpenter there. And he says, you wouldn't believe what this guy could do with a skill saw, the circular saw. He said he had minimal tools, simply because back then things were heavy and, and it was hard to be able to move them, right? So they had minimal tools. I mean, things back then were not made in China, right? They were like solid, you know, whatever. 
Uh, and so things were a little bit different. So they had to figure out how to be able to do it. So this guy was able to have very few tools, but do amazingly, amazing carpentry with it. So we don't always necessarily need the tools. The tools are wonderful. They speed the job up, uh, you know, if you have the right tools. Or, or you, so that sometimes you have to end up creating them if you don't have them. Um, that takes time. But yeah, you don't always need them. But yeah, tools are wonderful. Go ahead. Sometimes you also have to go by what you can afford. So um, we've renovated lots with no carpenters, except for my husband. And then I'm always questioning him, why are you doing it like that? <laughs> he's the one that knows what he's doing. But so sometimes the cost, right? You don't always can't afford to hire professionals or whatever. So luckily the husband can build. But we usually use cheap, whatever we can afford kind of materials. Yeah, improvise. <laughs> That's the lesson? <laughs> okay, right on. <laughs> I was going to say, a thing I've learned from the number of renovations we've done. Yeah, you've number done one, it takes longer than you think it will. It's true. And it will cost more than you more. think it will. <laughs> Always, yeah. Right. So what spiritual yeah. lesson is in that? Order? Planning. Count the Planning. cost. <laughs> Count the cost. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Thank you. And then double it. <laughs> okay. Oh, Randy again. <laughs> one last one. Yep. Caulking is wonderful stuff. It covers a multitude of <laughs> sins. <laughs> that's why we have MDF. <laughs> You know what? It's become very lazy carpentry, though, as a result. When you had hardwood, everything had to be bang, bang, perfect. And, but yeah, no, that's why you see. You know what? I was surprised. It was probably in the early 90s after I got interested and started working with finished carpentry, going into West Edmonton Mall and looking at the, at the finished carpentry there. Couldn't believe what I, what I was seeing. I was like, this is pathetic. These are professionals. Well, right, that are doing this, and it's just slapped together. I mean, you don't see it because there's so much goes on in a mall, right? You don't see the finished carpenter. When you actually stop and actually look at stuff, it's like, wow. I was amazed. So go ahead. Uh, I'm just referencing back to Randy saying the, the yes, dear thing. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about the work that God does in our heart, renovation, yep. and our reply should be, well, yes. <laughs> Not right. yes, I mean, we could say yes, dear, but. No, yeah, no, I, you're way. exactly right. Yeah. And that is what we should be saying, yes, Lord, right? For thy servant heareth, right? Uh, that needs to be our response always. Thank you for bringing that up. And the spiritual lesson, so important. I'm gonna end with this. Psalms 127 verse one says this, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Is that not true? Yeah. This is where, I guess, where I was all wanting to go with this whole topic here. We can have a perfectly manicured house, and we can do all this kind of stuff, but literally it's just a manicured tomb. That's really all it is, right? Unless the Lord is living in there and he's built that home, it is just a tomb that we're actually abiding in. It is so important, and I think as we actually are doing renovations, we need to keep this in mind, that the Lord needs to be building. And he can do that because the Lord is going to have some lessons as we're renovating for us to be able to show us ourselves. I know it. does it with me, and I know it'll do it with you. And those are opportunities that the Lord is actually building the house is when he's showing us. He's shining the light, right, on us, our character, and he's saying, this is a defect in your character that needs to be overcome, right? And, and as the Lord does this, and as we respond, the Lord is building, and we're building, and there's going to be something special about that home, right? Because things may not always go well. There may be setbacks. We may have to work with other minds, right? All those may test our character. I'd like to end with this. Sister White says, Christian homes established and conducted in accordance with God's plan. Does God have a plan? Oh. 
says are among his most effective agencies for the formation of Christian character and for the advancement of his work. God has a plan, and in that plan is the formation of character, and we're in that plan. And he sometimes allows certain situations to come into our lives which will test that character, to be able to show us, and then he shines the light on us. And it's painful, is it not? But as we submit to his work, oh, it's the most effective agencies for the formation of Christian character and for the advancement of his work. It says, home should be made all that the word implies. It should be a little heaven, right, upon earth. It says, a place where the affections are cultivated instead of being studiously repressed. It says, our happiness depends upon this cultivation of love, sympathy, and true courtesy to one another. True courtesy is important where we listen, we're willing to listen to each other, right? And to be able to say, hey, let's, let's, let's communicate this through. The corpus callosum needs to be activated. <laughs> it says, let your home be such that Christ can enter it as an abiding guest. Let it be such that people will take knowledge that you, of you, that you have been with Jesus and have learned of him. The master, right, Sean? The master. <laughs> I like that. It's true. It says, uh, it says, the home in which the members are kindly, courteous Christians exert a far-reaching influence for good. Other families mark the results attained by such a home and follow the example set. In their turn, guarding their homes against evil influences. So as people see us, it can also instill with them that same principle which will guard their home. You see that? We're not islands unto ourselves, are we? We are red of all men. We're watched and red of all men. It says, angels of heaven often visit the home in which the will of God bears sway. It says, under the power of divine grace, such a home becomes a place of refreshing, uh, of refreshing to warn weary pilgrims. Self is kept from asserting itself. Right habits are formed. There is a careful recognition of the rights of others. Do others have rights? It says, um, the faith that works by love and purifies the soul stands at the helm, presiding over the entire household. This is the household that God is building. It says, the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. This is heart religion that we're looking at right here. You see that? This is the power is in the home. But if God doesn't build the home, right? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So true, so true. So we can renovate, but in that renovation, if we add this renovation Along with it, we have a home, right? A home that will be also a witness to many that are watching, which they can learn principles from your home, they can take it to their home, and that becomes a safeguard for their home. And then that would go on down, 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 down the line. Do you see that? Affecting other homes, affecting other homes for good. Oh, this is what we need. This is the kind of renovation we need. Anyway, that was a little bit of my thoughts. I thought that we could look at renovations. I didn't have a lot of time to be able to prepare for this, but I was thinking, is there lessons we can learn from renovations? I think there are lots, right? That we can learn from renovations and how we can apply to us and the transformative power that can take place in our hearts and character for good, right? God bless as you consider these things. Let's close with... Number three, uh, 531, 531 will build on the rock. That's what we're doing, building who? On Christ. 531. Please 
standing. Lord, as we've looked at a bit of renovations, how important it is, Lord, that the renovation begins right. And it's not just right, Lord, in the way the world looks at renovations, but Lord, even before we start, how important it is we can see that you must be the first and foremost in that renovation. Because if it doesn't start there, it hasn't begun right. It doesn't matter what the materials are, what the tools are, even what the knowledge is. Lord, if you're not there, starting from the beginning, that renovation will not go well. And Lord, I just pray that we can learn lessons from this, that we need to come to you, realize in our great dependence day by day. But Lord, what work that you're wanting to do in uh, each one of us, I know will be amazing. Even the world will be amazed. They were amazed that even those that were with Christ back in the day, they said, hey, we, we, we know They've been with Christ. I pray that will be our experience day by day as we continue to grow more and more after the likeness of Christ. We thank you for this, for the study, some of the thoughts that we can think about even further than what we looked at today. We thank you for these things, and we praise in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.